Well, the great unknown, you know, it isn't what it used to be. The future is different to the one we used to know. You know life used to be more sequential, more, more structured, more predictable than what we see today. It used to be that you could uh, make decisions and you could set plans and you could track towards the future. Uh, not so these days. In fact, the future is not a place that we're headed. The future is coming at us with increasing velocity and unknown direction. The great unknown is headed our way. We just think about the world of change that we live in. Wherever we look, we see these massive transformations, robotics and the digital economy, machine learning, automation, uh, AI, quantum, quantum computing, it's phenomenal. And, and these changes and the speed of it is only going to increase. Indeed, elements of this future have already arrived. Uh, in your inbox, no doubt, you get uh, emails from the supermarket with customized specials just for you, your own pricing based on previous purchasing history. history. This is, of course, artificial intelligence in action. Uh, when you look at the Netflix uh, suggestions or the playlist that's automated on Spotify or maybe the, the Amazon recommendations, this is all predictive computing put into practice and the speed of it is increasing. Google and the autocomplete on that, that is crowdsourcing. Now you start to enter a question, it answers it before you've even asked it. That's based on the search history of thousands of other people, of course. I'm a parent of a few children at primary school, and so I've heard much about the floss, and I have now worked out that that's not about dental care, it's actually a dance move. And if you wanted to know something about the floss, well, you know, like any parent, you, you go and you type into Google floss and up comes, you know, as the very first suggestion, what anyone searching this really needs to know, how to do the floss, a parent's guide. <laughs> I've actually found it's, uh, it's quite useful. Uh, but it highlights the power of this data in tracking our future and it's got more useful applications as well, of course. You know, Technology has shaped us as a society. It's changed our perspective. We're global in the outlook that we have and the influence that comes our way. Because of the technologies, of course, we're digital in where we go to for information and we're social in what influences us. It's the likes and the views and the hits that start to shape our choices. We're mobile in terms of when and where we access information. A few clicks away from any piece of information at any time. And of course, we're visual in how we consume that content. In fact, so transformed are we as a society that safety professionals have had to come up with new safety signs in this era, like this one that I saw recently. In case of fire, exit building before Instagramming. <laughs> and no Facebooking on the way out and no selfies either. Now we're gonna keep it safe out there. That's the world of change. And so how we prepare for the future has to be different to the way we used to do it. You know, in the past, you could look back in time, look at those trends and extrapolate those forward. But that underestimates the future. You can even sometimes take a snapshot in time, what's currently happening, and forecast that forward. But that also is going to give a, a failed prediction. Uh, compared to gathering big data, looking in real time, utilizing the technology that is everywhere, looking at those big external mega trends and triangulating on the future, and so getting a better handle on what's next. Last Tuesday was quite the milestone in this nation. Uh, from a population perspective, we hit 25 million. And uh, it was great on the Australian Bureau of Statistics website at 11.01 p.m. watching that population clock tick over. Were you watching that or was it just me? It was just me, I thought so. But anyway, it was quite the exciting moment. But it was a great reminder of how previous forecasts indeed got the population growth wrong. And that's because Two decades ago, when the forecasts were made, they were looking back at the previous growth trends and extrapolating that forward, and they thought that we would get to about 23.5 million people in 2051. We surpassed that number five years ago. And there were some forecasts that looked at the current snapshot of trends that were happening in 1998 and forecasting that forward. And that said, well, we might get to 26.4 million people in the middle of this century. We'll surpass that in five years' time. The reality based on the changes that we've seen since then, the step change, the, the, the unpredictable speed of acceleration will take us beyond 40 million in 2051, and even that will need some upgrading or adjusting, no doubt. And so we can't 
take the sequential change of the past and think that will define the future. Uh, we've got technology everywhere and it has transformed things and ought to be used for a better understanding of what's next. 1969. You know the computers that landed that Apollo crew on the surface of the moon required, you know, they were main, mainframe computers, they were about the size of a car, there were a series of them, and yet less than four decades later, uh, what came out was the iPhone, those early editions indeed, have computational power hundreds of thousands of times that of those NASA computers. The, the, even in these early phones, the, the photography equipment, the navigational technology was way beyond what had been the case for the NASA mission. And so with these incredible technologies, these smartphones in millions of hands right around the world over the last decade, we've used this incredible technology to play Candy Crush. But we've, <laughs> we have used it for some useful things as well, and I'm encouraged by that. And, you know, Moore's law continues to be the case. You know, that the number of transistors we can get onto a chip will double every two years, and with that, an acceleration in computing power. That remains the case. 1997, the ASCII red computer, supercomputer indeed. It uh, could make calculations. It was uh, a processor that would run at uh, 1.3 teraflops. And if we want to know what a teraflop is, it's 1,000 gigaflops. Just thought I'd uh, clarify that. Must be, must be the case. I Googled that. But uh, it, it would basically fill a house and cost about $75 million to develop. And within 20 years, you could pick up the PlayStation 4, which had a computing power three times that of those supercomputers, and you'd carry it in your hand for about $500. That's the world of change we're in. And the ubiquity of the technology that we have today, if well harnessed truly, can transform the world. And of course, empower our societies and better connect us together. You know, we're living in this internet of things world with these devices everywhere. In fact, for every person on the planet, there are more than seven times as many connected digital devices. That's 50 billion of these things. And with all of them collecting data, and if that data can be combined to analyze trends and change, we can better get a better handle on what's next. Now, big data, it's not owned by any particular people, it's our data and it gives us a shape and a snapshot of who we are and where we're headed and can be used if harnessed well to transform things. Uh, think about the technologies that we have that monitor traffic, you know, literally hardwired into streets, these traffic monitoring systems. Think about the, the hardware that we see around the place, these signal boxes that monitor rail movements that, uh, that, that help traffic flow. Well, the reality these days is, and we've all experienced it, you pick up your, Google, your, your, your phone and you're on Google Maps and it tracks out a path for you. It'll tell you exactly how long it'll take to get to that de destination. It'll highlight where the congestion hotspots are. And it'll even, in real time, give you alternate routes that might pop up and make your journey faster. And all of that, not requiring any of that expensive hardware. And all done through crowdsourcing of content, through the sharing of that data. The data from the previous person who wrote, drove down that road is informing your journey, and the data from your journey is forming, informing the next person's journey. That's the power of this community data when used well. I mean, take these commuter apps that show not only when your train will arrive, but also which carriage you can sit in that has fewer people so that you're more likely to get a seat. This incredible data that we have available to us using in-train technology, but also the commuter data of others, the community data shared and making your individual experience better. There are more than 300,000 health apps available on your phone, all designed to improve your health and living. And many of that, those apps utilize, again, big data, shared data, and machine learning to bring about greater outcomes. I mean, here's an example. This is a, a mood monitoring app and, uh, and uses some of the best of the computer and, of course, the data of others. But I noticed when I used this last week, it uh, had a joy rating of 99% right there, but it was the day after the ABS released their quarterly demographic statistics. I was pretty excited at that moment. But it just highlights the power of big data and of the use of these apps and that collected community information to inform and help our particular journey. Even take flu tracking. 
you know, we can get those flu samples off to labs and get a confirmed case of that. We can get the data through the hospitals and GPs into a central database. And of course, that happens and helps us monitor flu. But the latest research has showed that you can do some social media tracking of that term. You can look at people searching flu symptoms even on Google. And that gives you not only an in-time snapshot of what's happening, but you can heat map where those searches are coming from and get an indication of what is to come. You know, this data, the individual data that we have, it's your data, it's my data, but it can help society as a whole. It was Carl Rogers who said, what is most personal is most universal. Another way of saying that is, you are unique, just like everyone else. And so all that unique data, when it's combined together, it can help us and others as well. But something's happened of late. We've got a bit more skeptical about technology. We start to control our data. We've been disappointed by data hacks and privacy breaches, of course. And, and the outcome is that we've got more pessimistic around the use of technology. We I mean, take this sentence for a moment that many may agree with. The internet is either the greatest blessing or the greatest curse of modern times. Sometimes one forgets which it is. Some people might say, yeah, that's, that's fair enough. It's actually a very old quote. I just changed one word in it. Originally, it was the printing press is either the greatest <laughs> blessing or the greatest curse of modern times. Sometimes one forgets which it is. I don't think anyone would be denouncing the printing press, even though this was uh, shared 100 years ago. You know, we've, we've come to see the benefits of these things. We might not like everything that's published, but we see the greater benefit. And so the internet and technology and big data, well, there are some challenges around it but surely we can harness it for the greater good. I put up here, at the height of the Industrial Revolution, a picture of the Luddites. They had some hang-ups with machines, the latest technology of the time. They didn't like the impact it was having on their livelihoods, and they picked up some hammers and smashed those things. And uh, even today with technology, we can feel the frustration. Uh, keyboard not found, press F1 to continue out. But I'm sure we resist the, the urge to pick up the hammer and have a go. Because we see, yeah, there are challenges there, but there are some great outcomes as well. And we need to get the best from the technology and manage those downsides. Now, clearly there are downsides. Uh, there's an American researcher, Eric Sigmund, who's been tracking for some time uh, the impact of technology through time use studies. And here's what he has found. Since the digital economy has emerged, we've got this rising green line of technology interaction, electronic media consumption in hours per day, this declining blue line of face-to-face -face interaction in every year of the lifetime of Generation Z. They've only ever known a world where the screen time outdoes the face-to-face -face time. This can have some impact in terms of social isolation, the diminishment of social skills, but we can observe that and also see the benefits of technology to connect. We see that the screen time can create increased sedentary lives. We see with young people an increase there, and if the trend continues, they will end up even beyond the current adult population where two in three of them, by the time the youngest Gen Z hit adulthood, uh, will be above the average weight range. But again, we can shift this and shape this by better utilising technology. Uh, now we are well aware of the data breaches and the problems with technology of late, the fake news and the fake friends, and it is a challenge, but what are we to do? Opt out, switch off, get off social media, push back on the technology, not a viable option. There are some people that have got rid of their social media accounts, but they are struggling uh, to deal with an analog life like this effort here. Be the first of your friends to like this post. It sort of is hard to respond in this social media world. And we've got a new generation that have only ever known the technology, and I think in their hands, well used, they can use this technology for human flourishing, for societal benefit, and to make a difference as we head to the great unknown. I mean, even the technologies are embedded in the labels that are given to this generation. The digital screen ages, the, the iGen, the dot-com kids, the, the generation connected, that's, that's who they are. And I think the idea of moving away from technology is not viable. Uh, there was a great story I heard about Muhammad Ali, you know, great boxer. At the peak of his powers, you know, he was excellent, but not known for his humility. Apparently, uh, he was on a commercial flight. They are about to take off, and uh, pre-flight announcements had taken place. But there's Muhammad Ali sitting there with his seatbelt undone. And the airline attendant said, no, seatbelt on, Mr. Ali. He just looked up at her, and he said, hey. He said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. She looked down at him, and she said, yeah, but Mr. Ali, Superman don't need no airplane either. So... <laughs> Buckle up. 
let's get ready for takeoff. We need the technology, but we've got to move away from the pessimism to the optimism and harness it for the greater good. I was running some focus groups with Generation Z and uh, they were not engaged with this discussion. It was around superannuation and, and their future. In fact, one of them summed it up pretty well. Uh, he said, after an hour of discussion, he said, look, it's not that we don't care on purpose. He said, it's just that we don't care. And I uh, <laughs> thought it was pretty eloquent. But how can we inspire them, raise the optimism, show that in their hands they have this incredible technology that can be a force for good? You know, we are more than numbers and the technology has its place. I remind you that the T of TED stands for technology. As a TED community, we generally have an optimistic view of technology and the data <clears throat> that it creates. And ideas are worth spreading, just as data is worth spreading, and it has an impact when it is well used. You know, all of the data points that we create. You know, we're, we're more than numbers, but we create numbers through decisions and through behaviors and through activities, and those numbers, when they come together, they create a picture of our society. They create a mirror of where we are. They show us who we are as a nation and give us a snapshot of what's next and our community as well. So can we utilize the power of technology in this amazing era? Can we use it with big hearts and good faith? And can we combine that with the power of community and the best of that, gathering those community insights and the data it presents and gather all of that together with the power of humanity and so using that to shape the great unknown.